we are about to begin our next panel. Just so you know, the screen right here, this QR code, if you'll click on that, you can submit questions for our panelists. At, um, the panel will be about 50 minutes long. The last 10 minutes will be for questions. So if you have any questions, use our QR code and you can submit those. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this exciting panel. All right, my name is Karen Plotkin, and I'm a senior vice president at Dell, responsible for strategy. And I'm super excited to be with you today to introduce this amazing panel, talking about two of my favorite things, Austin and innovation, and we're going to throw some technology in there as well. So Dell Technologies and the University of Texas have a long relationship from our company being started in a dorm room in 1984 to today when we work with students in engineering labs and the business school and everything in between. And what's really exciting about that is the innovation that comes out of this university and how do we take that innovation to market and use it to improve our communities but also to improve our businesses around the world. And that's what we're going to talk about in this panel panel today. And before we get um, to, the, to the panelists, apologize for that. Um, I, look, there's a great discussion to be had about the city of Austin as well. And we're, this panel today is technology leaders from all over the city and different companies in Austin, all doing great things to bring innovation to life. And I want to start by introducing our moderator today, and then she's going to introduce you to the panel. Christine Dixon Thiesing is the Associate Vice President for Discovery to Impact at UT Austin. How exciting is that? That's like the coolest job title ever, Innovation to Impact, or Discovery to Impact as well. She oversees a team of experts focused on bringing products and services to market by connecting industry, investors, and startups with UT innovators. She was also a founding partner and CFO of Cure Innovations and has served as a director of academic innovations for South Carolina Research Authority. Before I turn it over to Christine, I just want to say thank you to the crowd and thank you for the university. Dell Technologies really values the partnership that we have with the University of Texas. And as a Texas ex and a Texas parent right now, hook them. Thank you so much, Karen. Hello all, I'm Christine Dixon Thiesing and I'll be moderating the event today. As many of you know, Austin's basis for being a vibrant tech hub started with a series of events. Way back in the 1960s, for example, landing IBM here and then recruiting MCC and the Semitech Consortium here in the 80s. Those startups and spinouts that resulted from those activities are really the foundation for the tech uh, hub here in Austin today. And the University of Texas at Austin played a key role in making all of those things happen. And that's why today the university has committed as part of its 10-year strategic plan 
to replicating those successes in other deep tech sectors. That's why here today we have a panel representing semiconductors, AI, life sciences, and renewable energy in the energy transition. These are all areas that are of great interest to us going forward. Uh, before I dive into introducing the panelists, though, I have to let you know, this is quite an illustrious group we have here. Uh, if I were to give them a proper introduction, we would still be talking when, at 7.30 when Lucius takes this stage. So I'm going to give very brief intros, and I encourage you all to connect with them after the session as well, as many of them will still be here. We'll start off with Cheryl Ingstad. Cheryl is the Managing Director of the National Security Innovation Network, or NSIN which brings together academia as well as startups to help develop solutions to national security issues. Uh, prior to that, she was the director of the AI and Technology Office at the Department of Energy, and she's had a variety of roles in the public and private sector in AI and intelligence. So thank you, Cheryl, for joining us here today. Then John Kozarich. Uh, John started out as a faculty member at the Yale School of Medicine. He's here representing the life sciences sector today. Uh, after that, he was at the University of Maryland and then moved over to the private sector, where he was vice president of R&D at Alchemies as well as vice president of biochemistry at Merck. So he has had a variety of roles in big pharma, but is also a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he serves as the chairman today of Curza Therapeutics, which is based in Utah, in developing drugs to, for antibiotic resistance. Uh, John is also the chairman of Ligand Pharma, which is my personal favorite because about 15 years ago, uh, Ligand acquired the first startup I was with, uh, Cytex Pharmaceuticals. So thank you, John, for being here. And then we have Julie Johnston, who is the global energy portfolio lead for charging for Tesla. In addition to, she's been at Tesla for about six years, and before she was at Tesla, she was also in a um, clean tech policy role with Solar Cities up in San Francisco, as well as having uh, doing research and analysis of the electric as well as the uh, natural gas sectors and policy and uh, regulation there at MWR and Associates, MRW, sorry about that. And then finally, certainly not least, representing the semiconductor space, we have John Schreck. John's the CEO of the Texas Institute for Electronics, or TAI. TAI is a public-private partnership that is reinvigorating the semiconductor sector in Texas. So we're so pleased to have him here today. Previously, he had been the senior VP of DRAM as well as 3DXP Engineering at Micron, and also spent 17 years as a distinguished uh, tech technologist at, uh, I'm sorry, at Texas Instruments. So we really have a great amount of domain expertise on the stage here today. But where I'd really like to kick things off is talking about Austin. So Austin is known as a tech hub, but we're not known so much for other sectors like life sciences and, uh, well, we're known for semiconductors, certainly. So what do we need to do and where do you see the opportunity for the future of Austin in these deep tech domains? Julie, would you like to start us off? Sure, thank you, Christine. Uh, I think Austin's a really exciting place right now and certainly innovating um, ac across multiple deep tech sectors. I see this every day as I work from our manufacturing facility um, on the east side of town, which three years ad ago didn't exist, and is producing thousands of electric vehicles, American-made, um, right here in our backyard every week. Um, aside from manufacturing, Texas is a leader in renewable energy, um, which is key to the transition as we electrify uh, for renewable and sustainable energy. So I think a lot of exciting things going on. Over 10 years ago when I was a grad student at UT, um, I, I never could have foreseen this type of um, innovation and sustainability. Um, and um, just other uh, deep tech sectors uh, and, and all the opportunity that exists here today. It's very exciting. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to talk about something I'm really passionate about, which is the semiconductor industry, especially on the hardware side. Um, I think everybody's heard about the CHIPS Act, um, and Austin plans to play a big part in that CHIPS Act. Um, and really, what, one of the things that the CHIPS Act is doing is trying to address a gap of bringing hardware um, manufacturing back to the United States. Most of that is over in, in the Far East right now. 
And so, you know, Austin already has a, a very vibrant um, semiconductor business. We've got companies, IBM, AMD, Dell, NXP, Samsung, Infineon. We have a equipment manufacturer, Tokyo Electron, here. So, um, and if I left anybody out, please forgive me, but um, we already have a very vibrant um, semiconductor industry. But the place that we're really falling behind on is in workforce development. So as we try to grow our, bring our manufacturing back here, um, it, it's really a gap that we have to focus on. And, and one of the big issues we have right now is uh, students going into school really concentrate on software. They don't really think about hardware too much. And so we have a real branding issue to, to make the semiconductor industry, industry look exciting to everybody. And, and that's a real big challenge for us. Um, one of the things, let me talk to you a little bit about what Ty does, because we're talking about innovation. Ty, the Texas Institute for Electronics, is a public-private partnership that we're putting together, being driven out of the University of Texas. And what we're focused on is something called advanced packaging. And that is, that is involving something called heterogeneous integration. And what small to mid-sized companies, which are really the heart of innovation, um, what they suffer from is a case of um, it being very expensive to, to build large complex semiconductors and they take a long time. And what we're trying to do at Thai is basically democratize the semiconductor business. Okay, so what we mean by heterogeneous integration is we take um, small components, they're called chiplets, and we enable companies to innovate by putting all those things into one package. And that's, um, we, we really think that this is something that's gonna really spur a lot of innovation, and we, we really think that Austin can be the center of that. John, do you have any comments? Uh, is this on? Uh, can you hear me? Is that better? Okay. Uh, first off, um, I'm delighted to be here, um, and especially at Bangers. I, over the past 45 years, I've done my best to sample as much of the biotech, pharmaceutical, academic research space as I could. And uh, when people normally ask me, well, what are you, what are you doing now in terms of you know, starting companies and, 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 and looking and doing some work at, at the university, I usually go to my default answer is, which you really don't want to know about it. It's kind of like watching sausage being made. So I'm really delighted to actually be at Bangor's today to be seeing that. But um, regarding the question, one of the things that's always impressed me about Austin, since I've been coming here on and off since the 80s, uh, a former postdoc of mine became chairman in one of the divisions in, in pharmacy. Um, and um, I, I appreciated the fact that it has a very strong uh, academic uh, uh, vibe going on here, in addition to really being really a great town. So when I left uh, La Jolla, California in uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, I was looking for places that had that kind of um, uh, thing going on. And the first place I accepted a position at as CEO was at Curza in Salt Lake City, University of Utah. I know a lot of faculty there, great place. But uh, the opportunity here at Austin, I did this one on my own because I felt that Austin was a, f a fabulous place to really, had, had all of the right elements that I saw when, uh, back in the 70s when I actually saw the first biotech companies starting, like Genentech. Um, and, um, and so I felt this was an important area that had the right base. And the, the right base for really getting into the life sciences is to have a very strong academic core that you can now build around. That coupled with the fact that the university is really highly committed to the general concept, as amorphous as it sounds, of innovation. But innovation and, and then ultimately getting results from that innovation is really the core to building up companies. And that's when I came here uh, basically on my own to do that. I've, I've started two companies in Austin right now. And, I guarantee you, you've never heard of them because they're just flying under the radar right now. But uh, it's a great uh, city and uh, the university is terrific. I'm being treated very well in pharmacy and I hope to make it a, uh, the rest of my hopefully long career. 
Great. Well, I want to say thank you for inviting me here. I'm from the Defense Department, and uh, we're the National Security Innovation Network, and we are spread out across the country. We're in 26 states with 37 people. I'm very happy to say in the Southwest that uh, one of our leaders is stationed right here in Austin because Austin is so important to us. Uh, we have another person out at, uh, in College Station, and then the rest of the Southwest is up in, in Oklahoma. So this is a very important area for us. We're co-located with our headquarters uh, element, which is Defense Innovation Unit. And then we work with a lot of other defense organizations here. And our mission is to help bring in the early stage technology innovations into the DOD. So we work with the universities, and then we work in a thriving venture community. And we're here because of the thriving venture community and the top, uh, top tier research universities that are here in the location. And then uh, we also benefit from having nearby defense uh, organizations such as in, in San Antonio, the bases, and that we source uh, what are their innovation problems, what are they trying to, to solve. And we put that into the university system, we put that out to uh, the venture community to try to get solutions and bring them into the defense department. So this is a very important uh, location for us because of uh, the defense department base is not very far away. Uh, the fa fantastic university system where we cooperate on solving problems together and then uh, the venture community. So uh, another thing coming up here for us in the future is we've received uh, $50 million for mission acceleration centers from Congress. And so we are looking across the United States, where are those vibrant you know, venture communities that we should be opening a, a physically an, an open door to bring in those technologies and then help those companies find their way into the national security industrial base. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, now that we've talked about the landscape of Austin, I'm really curious what you see, what we're doing right in the tech sector that can be emulated to help foster these other t deep tech areas, and also where our blind spots might be. What is it that we need, and what are we missing? Yeah, I can, I can start with that. Uh, you know, Texas, uh, I'm talking about it from the semiconductor space. Um, Texas is number two in total semiconductor business. We have 211 companies here. And many of those are startups. And Austin is really central to many of those startups. So there's definitely a, a spirit, uh, there's an ecosystem that exists here um, of innovation. And I think in terms of how we can improve others and, and advance other se sectors, I think we need to study the ecosystem, innovation ecosystem that exists in semiconductors and try to apply that you know, to other areas. Um, so when I look at semiconductors, I look at the, the business as really being a keystone technology. Um, there's so many businesses that are becoming, that are growing because of new innovation that requires advanced technology in semiconductors. Um, and so I, I think there's, you know, that's, we can really leverage that to grow other businesses. Um, as far as hurdles, um, I think in some of these areas, you know, you look at Houston in terms of um, the momentum that they have in, in the medical field. Um, I think what we can probably try to do is try to use our university system to encourage startups to get those going, um, but, and then use them to start to build our own momentum. We just need to get started like the Dell Medical School. So I think there's definitely opportunity. Let's look to see what's been successful and build on that. Julie, would you like to comment? <laughs> sure. Um, I, I initially came to Austin uh, to attend UT um, for a graduate program where they offered a unique curriculum uh, that was quite progressive in sustainability at the School of Architecture. Um, I, I came back the second time uh, for affordability, which I, I think remains a, a, a very um, key challenge for Austin uh, to continue to grow and innovate and attract lots of businesses, um, but also maintain affordability that's so attractive uh, outside of a lot of the big urban hubs where other tech sectors are. Um, and of course, uh, it's to, you have to attract the, the entrepreneurs and the businesses, but you also have to attract the folks that can help grow them. Um, so I, I do think what Austin does far and away um, exceptionally is that 
Southern hospitality. It's a very wonderful place and a quite an easy place to build a community and to build a network. Excellent. And then I have a question for Cheryl specifically, but I do welcome the whole panel to weigh in on this as well. Cheryl, what do you view is the federal government's role in fostering innovation, the startup ecosystem, and developing the workforce of the future? Well, uh, the federal government plays obviously a, a major role, and I could speak a little bit more to the Defense Department and specifically the research and engineering, so that, you know, early stage uh, focus here. But we have a number of, of programs. So first I'll speak about en ENSIGN, National Security Innovation Network, what we do, and then I'll talk about a few other organizations uh, that we cooperate with in the defense innovation ecosystem. So uh, as I mentioned, we work with the universities, so we sponsor capstone projects, and that helps students and student groups solve a military problem, and then they work directly, and I mean weekly, with a military sponsor to try to solve that problem. And universities love it, the students love it, and, and you know we sponsor it. We also have summer internships where uh, students can work directly with the, the military at a DOD lab, or just, or even with the warfighter. So uh, they love that, it's a paid internship. It's all from our budget, so also a very popular program. And then we have, uh, we run challenges. So this can be student groups, but this can be uh, companies from the venture community as well, startups who are trying to solve some kind of a challenge that we put out there. And then there's a prize. And the best part if you win, you know, first, second, third prize is that now you're qualified as having competed and you can go on and win a government contract as sole source. You don't have to compete again for it. So that's a what you know wonderful benefit of, of uh, responding to some of our challenges that we put out there. And then we also do uh, programs with tech startups. So right now we have Propel. I just came from Hawaii. That's an accelerator program that we run, we fund. Uh, we had several hundred small companies apply for it, 12 won. And now they're being put through a 12-week rigorous uh, accelerator program at no cost to them. So uh, another very popular program. So we run programs like that that are uh, accelerators. And uh, one thing that I wanted to say about Texas, what we, we like is that you know here there seems to be a real strong sense of patriotism. We get a lot of students who apply for our programs. We get fantastic support at the universities. Thank you so much. And uh, we have a lot of tech companies here who are really eager to work with the Defense Department. So this is an area that we're, uh, we're very attracted to. And just a couple more points on the, the government and research and development. Many uh, defense organizations are now branching out into this innovation area. So you have AFWorks, Air Force, you have SoftWorks for, you know, uh, so SOCOM, Special Operations. The Navy has Naval X. So they're, they're all trying to do this as well. Like, how do we reach out and get those non-traditional startups? How do we get those new solutions into the Defense Department? And as you may have read in the newspapers, the national security industrial base has shrunk by 40% over the last couple decades. That's a real problem for us. We want to bring in not only new, new companies, but we want to bring in those new technologies. So, uh, so we're here because Austin is a, is a really important contributor to our, our national defense. John, do you have any thoughts on engagement with the federal government as well? Well, uh, that is actually a place that Ty really is, plans to, to work closely with the federal government on. Um, we have solutions that address security of infrastructure um, in the semiconductor chips, and that's, that's very key. Um, we just um, submitted proposals for, um, for some of the CHIPS funding around a defense program there and focused on um, secure edge computing. And so I think there's a very key role that Ty can play in, in supporting our defense industry. Anyone else want to comment on that? Um, just a comment on government opportunities that you may not be thinking about. Um, at, at the uh, company in Salt Lake City that I've been, uh, I was CEO, now I'm chairman of, uh, we uh, engaged the Defar Department of Defense. We're trying to develop new, anti new uh, antibiotics for uh, 
uh, a variety of resi uh, antibiotic resistant mechanisms. And uh, we, have, we have our platform, our technology platform, but there are other uses for this. And we actually engaged the Department of Defense because we had data that suggested that some of our compounds had activity on, on some of the, quote, weaponizable pathogens that the government worries about and to basically have solutions for handling these organisms. And so we actually uh, have a, a, a DOD grant. It's actually from DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And we have a grant that totals, I think, ultimately about $73 million because we have compounds that basically hit all of their, their the top four or five weaponizable pathogens. I mean, anthrax is one, and there are a whole bunch of others you've probably never heard of. Burkholderia strains and things like that. And the, the, the thing that makes them weaponizable, by and large, is that they can be aerosolized. And so that tends to be the, 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 the mode of action. And uh, so we now, can, that money is actually benefiting us because we now, from that work for, for, Di, uh, for DITRA, we actually have a number of compounds now that we know are actually great compounds for clinical use for. Um, in, in hospitals that we're working on developing as well. So keep an open mind when, when you're looking for grants because there's always a silver lining to everything you, you can find. Yeah, I would just add on to that. So our office works with the small tech companies and students to help them find these grants as well, even though we're not the grantor as, as the organization. We help companies or student groups professors find their way to those grants. So, for instance, the basic research office out of the Defense Department puts out over a billion dollars in research grants. And so we, we have our way to uh, connect, connect people in. So, John, I'm curious. You're a serial entrepreneur. You stood up companies in California, Utah, and now Austin. Could you walk me through your process for evaluating where you're going to stand up those companies? Well, I have to give credit to um, my uh, age, number one, but also just where I've been. I mean, I, uh, I've literally lived in, acad in academia since before the first biotech company even started. Uh, the first one was probably Cetus, uh, and then the second one, a few years later, and is the most notorious, is Genentech. And those were in the 70s. And, uh, one of the things I learned from my mentors at MIT uh, were that, uh, that I learned to be able to, that it was important that you learn to think translationally in, in life sciences. And that is not just, well, I'm making a drug or I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in developing a, a technology or a molecule, but also I now also have the ability to project that through time and space to understand all of the other things that I have to somehow engage to get that to a, an NDA, a new drug application approval for a drug. Now, I've been in my years at Alkermes and Merck and uh, ActiveX Biosciences in La Jolla, I've been on about 15 IND filings and four NDAs. Uh, one of the drugs which I, I'm most proud of is Genuvia, which is uh, a uh, major drug for type 2 diabetes from that I was involved with at Merck. But getting back to what do you look for in a company, you need to find people in the company. Number one, you have to see the passion. You know, I get passionate about things and I like to think about the chemistry. That's my touchstone. I want to understand what the thinking was, what the innovation was and substantively in terms of how it works. And then once I know that, my experience over uh, the, the years has given me a, an understanding of how I can project that on its path to getting to a drug. Now keep in mind, not 90% of what you're thinking about is gonna fail. I mean, that's just the, the life of a drug, but if you keep doing it and you keep applying that, uh, you'll ultimately be successful. So I look to find ideas that appeal to me from a basic science point of view and then the second part, which is even just as critical, are the founders of the company. You know, founders, it's like this is their baby. And so now 
you have to be willing to not only nurture their baby, but at some point they have to give the baby the keys to the car and to, and to allow it to go out driving by itself, okay? And that's the key. Can you find people who have the, the awareness to understand that what they started and created all by themselves now has to have other people investing in it and, and that requires a, the right kind of people to do that. I can tell you that there are some founders who have a lot of difficulty making that transition, but there are others that get it. And the key is, when you're starting a company, always keep that in mind, that at some point, the baby's gonna be somewhat grown up and has to go on now to a, a different uh, way of life. So we've mentioned so far, both John and Cheryl have alluded to it, that workforce development is a challenge in building out these deep tech ecosystems. There's a lot of people in the audience today, this being South By, that are not living here in Austin or here in Texas. So I'm really curious, we'd love to get them to come here. So let's make this a sell. What brought you all here? Most of you are transplants. What attracted you to Austin and to Texas? Well, so since I'm the most recent one, I can tell you it's, it's a it's sort of a mixed story. My, my wife is a Texan. And of course, I'm an East Coast boy, ultimately. And uh, we met on the East Coast. And um, uh, she always, uh, she has a couple of sisters who live in, one lives in Austin, uh, in, uh, rather in Houston, and the other one lives in College Station. Now, the downside from my, at least what I've learned is for me, is that my wife is an Aggie. Um, she, she was actually, she was in the first class that graduated women, women from Texas A&M. And so she has a very strong vibe about it. But I have to say, after being here for a couple of years in, in Austin, I think she kind of likes this a lot. So uh, I think it's kind of working out. So that and the fact that this was from coming from California where it was getting increasingly difficult to even employ people of the right caliber and, 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 and interest. Um, coming here, it's, it's looking a lot easier to do that. I think Austin has an, an exceptionally high quality of life. Um, so for me, it's always been Austin, even in the Bay Area, trying to figure out a way uh, how to get back here. Um, and I, by that, I mean fantastic parks and open space, uh, great nightlife and um, Red River, all, all the, the places to go to see your favorite bands. Um, and, and more so than that, it's always just felt uh, like a small town with big impact. Uh, and more recently, a small town with global impact. And, and I think that's quite attractive. Um, I feel very grateful to be um, in one of the places I feel is, is really leading uh, in sustainability and innovation. Uh, which was not the case when I graduated from UT uh, over a decade ago. So it's really changed and I'm, I'm very excited to see where that goes. And I can weigh in as well as a recent transplant. I came to Austin two and a half years ago and it really was the innovation element that drew me here. So I came from South Carolina, from Charleston, uh, where the corporate R&D dollars in that state are a quarter of what they are in the Austin metro area alone and just the tremendous opportunity, the diversity of the technologies, as well as the University of Texas and its deep domain expertise across such a broad range of disciplines. So I'm thrilled to be here today. Anyone else? All right, well, from my perspective, some of the most interesting and disruptive technologies come from the intersection of disciplines. So here we have folks that have worked in AI and uh, the energy transition, life sciences, and then the semiconductor space. And I'd love to hear from them about where they see these convergences that can really make a difference. Um, I mentioned earlier about semiconductors being a keystone technology. And because we have such a uh, a network and, and vibrant semiconductor business here. Um, I think that that um, that is where real opportunity for innovation exists um, because, um, I mean, we're learning about um, really interesting technology, um, semiconductors filtering and monitoring what, what, what your blood chemistry is like and what, what type of pathogens can, be, can exist. It's, it's amazing where the application... 
it's amazing what the application of semiconductors can be. Um, you know, edge computing, automobile, medical. Um, so I, I just think there's, I think being a keystone technology with what we have here in Austin, I think it's just going to draw more and more uh, different areas of innovation here in Austin. Yeah, one thing we look at is how, how can we bring different groups of students together to work on uh, a problem and, and view it from different aspects. So having this multidisciplinary approach is really important. And you know, uh, when we don't get that right and we don't start off that way, we, we run into problems later. And um, you know, w one story we, we have is we have uh, worked with a company that uh, it's called PySun, and they have developed neuromorphic controls for drones. And you can use a hand signal, point to the drone, and then uh, give it a signal to go out. And you can point to it up in the sky and give it a hand signal to come back. This is very important for warfighters when you're on the ground and you need your awareness and you want to keep one finger on the, on the trigger. But we don't yet have a way to tie that capability into our whole communication system. And this is where you see, like with the edge computing and with our hardware systems, um, how, how do we, and that's probably like one of the next stages we'll go to, is how do we tie this into our entire you know, command and control system for unmanned aerial systems. So uh, th it is really important that we work in a multidisciplinary fashion. So Thank you. In, in my domain, the intersection between um, energy and electrification, I think Texas is a, a very interesting um, environment for that. Uh, a lot of wind overnight, um, and when we think about how to uh, ensure that the transition to electric vehicles and electrification is renewable and consistent with when renewable resources are generating, um, it, there's uh, the competitive retail marketplace uh, for electricity here, um, paired with those resources, provides um, a lot of interesting price signals to help uh, to help with those behaviors. So, um, I, I think um, statewide, uh, that's that's quite interesting. And they did say I could put a plug in that I'm always hiring for those types of uh, roles and thought leadership and the. Uh, the intersections of those uh, those different spaces. Please come see me. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I really do want to, I know this is a self-serving question. This is the UT House, and I do have to ask a question, though, about the role of academia. So what is the role of a, a research university in driving innovation, driving the startup ecosystem? And where do we have areas that we could improve? And there's still gaps. Um, I, so. You know, it's amazing how many of these startups actually start in the university environment, and I think that's a, a key role that the universities play. They're, they're also, when I went to school, compared to what I see now, the, the amount of effort in the universities to give hands-on experience. Um, uh, UT has this 3D printing that anybody can use. It's just amazing what universities have to offer these days. Um, and certainly, the biggest area that I think, and I mentioned this earlier, is um, some of the gaps that we have in our workforce is key what uh, the universities obviously play a very key role in um, in, in the startup in, in terms of a startup ecosystem I mean the, the it's difficult for for um, for startups and new companies to find talent and so it's up to the university to help um, help that out I think one important area for universities to contribute in, you know, defense department kind of type of uh, research in some of our programs is uh, with the expertise. So, you know, we're able through our network across the country and how close we, closely tied we are through our programming with universities to identify who is the best professor or, you know, top few professors in, say, autonomy. So when we have a problem coming in from the Defense Department, we can connect them immediately on how to solve a, a problem in, in that area. And we can see those up and coming students and then even maybe some of the technologies that, that they're developing. So that's really, that's really important. And I think, you know, I'd reference to what John mentioned with the facilities. Having testing facilities, having the 3D printers, you know, so that 
uh, first prototypes can be made. One of the programs we, we run is a very high value program and uh, everyone really appreciates it who gets in is called the Maker Program. And we help those small tech startups uh, make their very first prototype. So we contract for that equipment and for that expertise so that they can uh, use those facilities and create their first prototype and then go test it with, uh, with the DOD. And sometimes you the testing facilities too that uh, testing ranges that universities have and we're able to test those first prototypes. So I really wanna thank the university. Uh, I actually saw a, a test flight of a UAV on my last visit here in January at UT, at the stadium, uh, beyond impressive. And so, yeah, we, we really appreciate our university relationships. And since two of you have mentioned additive manufacturing, I'm going to go ahead and put in a plug here for the Center for Additive Manufacturing and Design Innovation, CAMDI. So that is a center that is accessible to outside, people that are outside of the university, industry, startups especially. They have industrial grade and industrial scale additive manufacturing capabilities. It's called CAMDI for short. If you're interested in learning more, come hunt me down after the panel and I'll, I'll tell you some more about it. Uh, but I do also want to share with you all that UT is truly committed to this space. We're committed to our startups. And so we have launched a strategic plan for research commercialization. We're in the final phases of it right now. We kicked off our seed fund in the fall with our first investment in a life sciences company. But it is really the objective of the Discovery to Impact team to ensure that our startups have a continuum of support from the first idea that they have all the way to the point that they're investor grade. We wanna meet the investment community where they're at and make certain that we don't have gaps. So we're always looking for advisors as well as mentors. I'm putting more plugs in here. I'm layering plug on top of plug, but uh, we're very interested in engaging with you all as well as our alumni base uh, as an intellectual asset for us. Uh, I'm, I'm remiss for putting in another plug for Ty right now in that how it came about was from a professor that understood that there was a huge gap in advanced packaging in the U.S. So right now, um, we 97 percent of the packaging is actually done overseas, and this advanced packaging technology is actually a really real opportunity for us. So this is a case where um, this became a uh, he came and sold that to the university, sold it to the state, and it became a very high priority. So it's an example of of starting at the university. Um, creating this structure and filling a gap that's critical to the state but also to the national security of the U.S. So it's a good example of how the university can play in, in supporting functions like that. As a hiring manager, the university is the first place I go. Um, I, I reach out to the career centers, alumni networks, and if I'm lucky, uh, I do get a response and sometimes a great candidate. Um, I've actually built some of my team here uh, with UT alum uh, that, that reach out to me directly through the alumni network. So certainly a critical uh, function to play in, in businesses that are scaling locally. Yeah, let, uh, get it, getting back to the students for a minute and what, and what, what I look for is that um, since I'm an adjunct, I have an adjunct position in pharmacy, I've been teaching, I've been lecturing in courses. So I've, I just finished a stint of six lectures on, on something I called case studies in drug discovery and development. And what I find is that th these students are, are really smart. They, they, they really enjoy seeing the translational layout of things. So I'm not just talking about the drug, but I usually start, let's say uh, last, uh, I talk about um, HR, po HR uh, a, a negative, uh, uh, HR positive, HER2 negative breast cancer. And you know, there are, you see commercials on TV for these things, the direct to consumer commercials for uh, iBrands, Kiskali, maybe some of you have seen these commercials. And I spend time going through those compounds and saying, well, what are these commercials about? And what, why are they competing with each other? And you begin to understand, and since a lot of this stuff I have a fair amount of my own inside knowledge on, I can at least discuss, well, notice how these two compounds have slightly different chemical structures, but they lead to slightly different outcomes in terms of, of advantages. And of course, that's a marketing tool. 
And so, you know, all of the science, all of the life science is not gone to waste in marketing. They use it. You just don't, you just don't hear about it. And the best way to understand it is to dig in. And, do, and one of my goals for the university is to, instead of giving six lectures, to have about 24 of these to make a whole semester course out of it. And each one would be on a different type of drug topic. So, and the students are really receptive to that. So it's, it's a great environment for me to just kind of float in and start something. And I've gotten very strong support from the, the dean of pharmacy and, and uh, uh, my other colleagues. John, the universities also play a key role in driving ecosystems in the life sciences. Could you talk about what you've seen in some of the areas where you've lived historically? Well, uh, a, a, a number of uh, the technologies that I've worked on over the years have been sort of, um, sort of pieced together from other things. But uh, when I moved out to La Jolla in uh, 2001 to start a company called ActiveX Biosciences, some of the original technology came out of Scripps, and then we used that technology uh, to, to kind of expound in different areas of being able to interrogate different classes of, of drug targets, like protein kinases, for example. I don't want to bore too many of people here who don't understand that, but um, a lot of that is um, uh, really spending a lot of time with the faculty as well and understanding what they do. And I'm doing that here. I, I have a number of colleagues that I'm fairly close with in chemistry uh, as well. And so for me, coming in here a couple of years ago, I'm still playing catch up. I'm still trying to meet the, the key venture groups in town. And also the ones you don't hear about, the smaller family investment groups. Um, they tend to operate at a sort of an earlier stage maybe in uh, what we like to call you know, religiously, the angel stage of a company, you know, and you need some angel investors. So, uh, so this, it's a great uh, opportunity here to be involved with the university to, to leverage that kind of stuff. Excellent. Well, we are running out of time here, so I do want to remind everyone in the audience, you are able to submit questions. There's a slide up here where you can scan the QR code to be able to submit your questions to the panel. We, ha we have a, quite a brain trust up here, so I encourage everyone to ask questions. Uh, but before we move into the Q&A section, I did want to highlight for you all, we also at the same time are having a networking opportunity. It's in the uh, speakeasy space, which is underground, right around here. And we have 10 different startups from UT, both students as well as faculty-driven startups, where people can engage and learn more about our startup ecosystem. From noon to two, you all are missing out right now on the, on the group that's focused on the physical sciences and the computing sciences. But at, from two o'clock to four o'clock, we'll have our life science companies in there. And we encourage you all to go down there and meet some of these innovators, inventors, and entrepreneurs and give them your support. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen, who's going to lead the questions. Thank you. We have a couple of great questions so far. Let me move out of the way here. So um, the first question is for John. How can the Texas Institute for Electronics help people looking for jobs in the Austin semiconductor industry? Um, well, I mean, to me, one of the areas that we're, that we're um, focused on, like I mentioned, was democratizing the industry by enabling startups and, and mid, small to mid-sized companies be able to innovate. And, and our, our belief, and one of the things that we're expecting and, and planning for for the Commerce Department is to grow businesses by enabling that capability. So what I see is um, we, we hope that th these startups grow, become big innovators, and, and start hiring a bunch of people. Um, that's that's what the commerce is looking for us. Awesome, thank you. Great advice. So um, the second question I think can go to anyone on the panel, but for recent grads who are staying in Austin, what are some UT projects or groups that they can get involved with to support the startup ecosystem? 
Well, I'll field that question first, if you all would like. So Discovery to Impact does have two units that focus on startup support. The Texas Innovation Center, which is a collaboration with the Cockrell School of Engineering, as well as the College of Natural Sciences. And it's there to help early stage company, it may not even be a company yet, but really testing out the feasibility and the product market fit. Uh, they view themselves as a venture studio. And then we have the Austin Technology Incubator, which is unique because it's not only supporting UT startups, but it's also supporting startups globally at this point uh, in the sustainability area in particular. Now they will be expanding their scope over time, but right now it's really around renewables and the circular economy. So uh, I would ask that they connect with me and I can connect them with their resources because we have more than 70 startups, deep tech startups today in the pipeline at UT, and that's not counting our more than 100 student-based startups as well. And we're always eager to get an extra pair of hands because as you all know, starting a company, uh, it takes every help, bit of help that you can get as well. Do any of you have any thoughts? Maybe for uh, active students, um, I'm always looking for great interns and uh, looking at UT for that first and foremost, both for undergraduate and graduate. So for those that are looking for experience um, in a company, um, certainly I think local businesses are great for that and um, there's, there's a lot of internships available um, for a lot of folks that, that are looking for those types of, of roles. Excellent. Well, those are all the questions we have today. All right. Are there any closing comments from the panel? Oh, actually, we have a late-breaking question. <laughs> is it okay if I drop that Absolutely. in? Absolutely. <laughs> so the question is, has the DOD invested in AI, and in what ways has the DOD funded the weaponization of defense capabilities of AI? Uh, yes, the DOD is investing in, in AI and s significantly. And I don't know the answer to the question, the second part of that that question, because I'm not uh, actively involved in it, and I'm more out, out here with you guys on the front end of, of things. So, uh, but yes, very active. And and actually, you know, AI is one of the the topics that we're looking for companies who are really advanced in that area. Other uh, DoD organizations in innovation are are also looking for the latest in AI technologies and. Uh, and, and how to adopt them and, and bring, transition those into the DOD. Excellent. And one other question came in. So, and I think this is for everyone who is in Austin. So how do you feel about the competition from the other emerging tech hubs across the US? I mean, we know Austin is the best, right? But. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'd like to comment on that because we are a nationwide network and so if a problem comes in to us from say Army Futures Command who's here, it may not be solved by a, a, an organization like UT or Texas A&M or a, a startup here in, in Austin or even in Texas. We put it out to our national network and let's say for instance it's a modeling and simulation type of solution that's needed then it might go to Arizona State University, it might go to University of Central Florida, and I think that's the beauty of having a nationwide network, and the opposite can happen, a problem can come into Seattle, and we don't have the best ecosystem there to solve it, and then it comes here to Austin to be solved. And I, as the principal investigator for the NSF i -Corps program for the Southwest Hub, I can definitely attest that we actually need a network. It is not about a competition. It really is going to be a heavy lift for the United States to remain a leader in these fields and a pioneer. So our network for i -Corps spans across four states and eight institutions. And we all work together to help coach the startups to become successful longer term and again, to find that product market fit. So I, I would respectfully disagree that it's a competition. <laughs> That's awesome. So let's give it one second to see if there's another question coming in. And it doesn't look like there is. So All I'll right. it back to you. So does anyone have any closing comments they would like to make or something that hadn't been able to crop up in the course of the conversation? 
All right. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you for having us. And again, please do come visit the networking session in the Speakeasy. It's air conditioned, uh, if that's an attractant. But come, come meet our entrepreneurs and see the earth-shattering breakthroughs we have coming out of UT. Thank you all so much for joining us.